Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? It's Rock and Larry Locken here. It's really a pleasure to do my first solo talk um, on the What's Your Opinion channel in association with Opinion the Facts, created by the great Kenny Jackson and my new soon-to-be new co-host of a great show. And we've got a lot of great things coming for you in store in the future. But I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a solo talk today about how our government works. Because I know a lot of people, whether you're in love with our government, whether you trust it, whether you don't, whether you don't give a shit about it, whether you just hope it would crumble. I think it's important for people, though, to know exactly how the government structure works um, for various reasons, whether you want to get involved in government or whether you want to see complete change. You know, you want to see just a complete breakdown of the system and the way we we, we structurally run the government. If, even if you're somebody like that, you need to know the parameters, you need to know the ins and outs of how it works. So let's just start off with, um, I'm going to start talking about some of the branches of government. We'll move on to Congress, Senate, and presidential powers in a minute, but I want to get the scary part out of the way. The Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a body of nine individuals that are basically the supreme law of the land. One of the most important reasons to vote is so that you can have a candidate in there that will put somebody on the Supreme Court that you know has some logic, has some sense and sanity. Right now, the way it draws down in our Supreme Court, it's five to four, a five to four Republican Democrat split right down party line. Um, and the thing about the Supreme Court is these things are lifetime appointments. Okay, these people that are appointed are going to be there until literally they pass away. I mean, they will bring them in on respirators if they have to and make a vote. And, you know, and in some cases, I'm glad. I'm glad that, for instance, Ruth Bader, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is trying to hang on and hang on because even though it's a five to four Republican majority, one of the older Republicans is, is pro-abortion, so he sides with the minority on abortion issues. And if, if he decides to retire or if Ruth Gader Beta Ginsburg or something happened to so Sonia Sotomayor or some of these other people, then what would end up happening right now is with a Republican Congress and a Republican Senate, you would have somebody elected that is completely of an alt-right, right-wing ideologically religious type of thinking and it wouldn't be very long at all and people think this is just a scare story but Roe v. Wade could be overturned really easily. Women if you care about your reproductive rights they really already got the votes to do that in the Supreme Court and there's nothing that can be done and then it goes to state and if that happens of course it becomes a state issue and if it, depending on which state you're in you know, they have the right to either illegalize it or, you know, keep it legal. So the Supreme Court is the law of the land. The Supreme Court can be really dangerous, too. Um, and this is going to tie into something kind of what I'm going to talk about a little bit later about the Electoral College. But in the year 2000, we had an election between George W. Bush, of course, and Al Gore. Well, Florida was up for grabs late into the evening, and it was first reported that Gore had won Florida. That's given him the election, but not so fast. Uh, Governor Jeb Bush of Florida at the time and Secretary of State Kevin Harris said, no, 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 all the votes aren't in. So we fast forward a few days in, in this debacle, and it turns out it looks like Bush has won Florida by 538 votes if my memory serves me right, but that was enough to initiate a recount, and it was really controversial. The Republicans were bitching and complaining and whining about it and bitching, and here's, what, here's, here's the most ironic thing. They were down to just a couple of needing just a couple of more days to finish the recount. Um, it would have been finished on this Sunday night. Well, for the first time in history, the Supreme Court decided to not only overstep their bounds, but they uh, met on a Saturday, on a Saturday afternoon. They didn't wait till Monday. They met on a Saturday and on a five to four down party line decision, ordered the recount in Florida stop. Now, the recount continued through Sunday night anyway, just to get an unofficial total. And when it was all said and done, Al Gore had won 
Florida by 150 or so votes. Um, you know, of course, you have a third party candidate that probably took away 20,000 votes from Gore in Florida, too. Really, really ironically, I want to say too about that election is that it's the first presidential candidate that I can remember in, in history that lost, or in recent history, that lost their own home state. Al Gore lost Tennessee. Ironic thing was, Al Gore only needed three more electoral votes to get 270 and win the presidential race. At the time, that's how many electoral votes Tennessee had. So had he won his own home state, like a candidate usually does, the point would have been mute and it would have been a 270, 268 Gore decision versus waiting for that recount of Florida. And Florida's got like, man, Florida's got like 29 electoral votes. So, you know, that was, so that was that. And so that's just, you know, that's kind of some of the things the Supreme Court can do. Um, then you've got, you've got the House and you've got the Senate. Now, a lot of people, when they think of the House, they think of the term Congress. But Congress really means both the House and the Senate. Okay, so they're two separate legislative branches. The House has approximately 435 members. And it's based on, uh, they come from various districts of various states, depending on how big a state is. You know, they have a certain amount of districts where they have a congressman that represents them in the U.S. Congress. Um, and that also ties into, too, sometimes when, I know we've got the census coming up in 2020, and sometimes what the Republicans like to do, especially in southern and midwestern areas, they like to try to do, and you'll have to look this up, but what's called gerrymandering. I'm not really going to get into explaining gerrymandering, but it's kind of a fucked up way of um, redistrict, re taking part of a state and redistricting that congressional area to where the votes in that area will, you know, maybe will favor favored Republicans a little bit more. But so back, getting back getting back on topic. So you got 435 people in Congress. They have to run every two years. Their election is up every two years. Now you've got the Senate. On the other side, on the other side, you've got the Senate. There's 100 members of the Senate, two from each state. Now, why, why would we have two from each state when you've got states that have more you know, you've got states that have more tumbleweeds than people, and that state has the same amount of senators as New York or Texas or, or California or wherever. Um, the reason is, is because back when they created the Constitution, they wanted a, these big, big, huge land barren owners in the South and in the Midwest wanted to make sure that their voice was protected. That they had, the, you know, their voice was always going to be heard against the bigger states and all that. So they had equal representation. So, you, so what basically you got a state like Montana or Wyoming with, you know, like I said, more tumbleweeds and dust flying by than anybody with a pulse, okay, versus a state like California, Texas, New York, uh, you know, Florida that have. 50, 30, 100, you know, hundreds of times of people that some of these places have, thousands as many. And so what that does is, though, is that keeps kind of the Senate in gridlock. Um, it's usually never more than a, you know, one to five person uh, majority, whether it's Republican or Democrat. And, and, and this ties into two. I know I'm kind of all over the place, but when people talk about impeaching Donald Trump, Okay, because Bill Clinton was impeached, but he wasn't thrown in office. This is what has to happen. First of all, it has to go through Congress. There's 435 members of Congress, okay? And it can be a one, even a one vote, one vote difference to impeach, okay? So they impeach him. It goes over at that point, he's impeached, but then it has to go over to the Senate for a trial, okay? Which when Bill Clinton went over to the Senate, they voted, you know, it was. They voted no. They voted completely against it. Here's the deal. You need 67 senators for impeachment, okay? I mean, it's 51-49 right now, Republican-Democrat, okay? Even if the Democrats took back over the Senate this fall, 
and say it was 51, 49 in our favor, or even if it was 50, 50, which 50, 50 doesn't really matter either because when it's 50, 50, whoever's vice president at the time, which would be Mike Pence, would break the tie. But we, but like I said, you need 67 senators. So that would mean you would need every, every Democrat and then you would need to pick off like anywhere from 15 to 20 Republicans. And man, I mean, I, I don't see it happening. I, well, and, and the reason too also is once the ball gets rolling on this, say like after the elections, after the new congressional um, season has started in January, okay? Then things start really heating up. Maybe Mueller comes out with his, you, you know, you got to understand these investigations take years. Okay. So say, say sometime in March or wherever, or early summer, you know, the Mueller findings come out. So maybe they start impeachment hearings in the Congress. Okay. By that time, you're getting into late 2019. You know, they go through the motions, takes about six months. It's early 2020. And then if they impeach him, then it has to go over to the Senate. And meanwhile, while this is going on, we're like in our election cycle. Okay, we're, we're running. So, but, and then he also has an appeal. So he, he could be, it still wouldn't affect his impeachment. But by the time everything was said and done, it would, ju it would be just about the time again that the election would be happening in 2020. So, so that's interesting. There's also what's called the 25th Amendment. If, enough, if everyone on his staff agrees that he's not competent, they can sign off on a bill and have him removed. But you know none of his pockets would do that. I'm like, I mean, my God, Mike Pence, I don't even think has a... Well, I know he doesn't have a soul, but the guy is just... Uh, I don't know, man. The guy gives me the creeps, personally. Pence gives me the creeps. I would have hated to grow up in his household. But... Understand this about the Senate in the, in the House, okay? This is how, this is going to be my last point, really. This is how bills get passed, okay? The Senate may take up a bill and decide and, come, you know, they have, and each of these, keep in mind, both bodies have several committees, okay? They're all headed up by whoever the political power of that party is, who's ever in charge of that party, um, or the party in charge. And so say the Senate drafts a bill, okay? Then they've got to send it over to the House. The House has to approve it or make amendments to it and negotiate on it. Um, and if that happens, then it goes up to the president to sign. The president can veto it. If the president veto it, vetoes it again, then it takes two thirds of the, of the Senate to override it or the Congress. Um, I think both that I'm not sure on it's two thirds of either one or both on that as far as um, overriding the presidential veto. I think it might be what what body initiated, like, for instance, the Congress or the House also drafts bills, but then they have to have theirs approved by the Senate. So it goes back and forth between the two of them and they negotiate. So you see the, the minutia of it all. Even if we lived in a non-corrupt fucking non-lobbyist type of society, it sets up, what it does is it sets up the possibility of really just rigmarole of nothing getting done. But I think the important thing is, is that we really need to get rid of lobbyists, people like that, third parties. I would encourage people of like a real progressive third party type of mind though. To try to stick it out a little bit and change the Democratic Party. Um, Jill Stein is not going to be the way to go. These little parties that show up every four years that don't do any grassroots work actually are never going to go anywhere or get anywhere. I think me personally is to vote for Democrats who don't take corporate PAC money, support Democrats that are coming up and running in primaries against people like Pelosi and people like um you know, uh, Chuck Schumer and established uh, Democrats, but I would take any of those any day over any Republican. So it's very important to understand that, that when you don't vote or you don't care what's going on, um, you've got nine people on that Supreme Court that, are gonna, that can affect your life. 
They could overturn gay marriage in a second. They could overturn Roe v. Wade, like I said. So just, you know, I want to, I just kind of wanted to explain that to people, you know, and, and take that in a little bit. Listen to me back if you have to, um, to kind of get what I'm saying and, and how it works. There's an interesting, if anybody remembers Schoolhouse Rock, I grew up in the 70s or 80s, there's a little cartoon called I'm Just a Bill. And that describes it perfectly. I looked that up if you want to know exactly how all this shit and this minutia works, right? Okay. And then, of course, on state and local levels, you have the same thing. Every state has a governor and its own um, state congress and state senate and, you know, whatnot. And cities have mayors and councils. And, you know, it's just important to know all this stuff, whether you give a fuck or not. Because I always ask people that want to blow the whole thing up. I'm like, Okay, but what are you going to do the day after? What are you going to do the morning after? How are you going to get power to people, keep Wi-Fi on, food, um, keep services going? Okay, those are things to think about. That's why, even if you really want to take down the government, you need to know exactly, exactly every boring detail you can find about how it works. And with that, I'm going to give another shout out to Kenny Jackson. I love you, brother. I know you're working hard. I appreciate everything you've done for me. And um, I'm sorry, I could the way I had to set this up, I couldn't, I can't see any comments if there's any comments, but um, feel free to leave comments afterward after I post this. So I'd like to just wish everybody much love and let's just keep on keeping on. That's all we can do. But aware, remember, not just knowledge is power. Consciousness and awareness is real power. And that I'm out. Oh, by the way, check out our page, What's Your Opinion Show, on Facebook and Twitter. We might tweak the name of the show and the logo. You know, we're still, Kenny and I are going to have a meeting tomorrow and I kind of finalize some things. So um, it's been great so far. And I look forward to this uh, being a part of this empire that Mr. Jackson is creating. Mm hmm. Peace out, everybody. Much love.